Let's get this show on the road, shall we? Good morning, everybody, and hello. Welcome to the Heart Truth. My name is Daniel Martin. I am so happy to be your host. I've been so happy to, to, to be at this event for many years as it's been run as an annual event. I host Health Matters on CNA 938, and I have the opportunity to interview doctors on a daily basis. And I featured many of our speakers today on my shows as well, and I know how important heart health is to each and every one of you and to Singapore as a whole as well. And it's so interesting, I've been doing, congratulations on 15 years, by the way, NUHCS. Uh, as I was watching that, I was like, oh, okay, I've been hosting for 16 years on radio, so we're the same age, we're the same, same peers uh, in that regard. Uh, I don't have a medical degree, though. But every year, I repeatedly cover these topics. And of course, the newest advancements and developments. And I realized that every generation of Singaporean has very similar questions as our lifestyle changes, as of course our medical care changes as well. And it's important to keep answering these questions. So that's why I'm so happy to be back at The Heart Truth, as these questions that you want answered will get answered today. After all, this, The Heart Truth, is an annual health education seminar. And it features the NUHCS medical experts who will be presenting the latest information on a variety of topics of heart disease, heart health, and heart care options for the public. As you've seen in that 15-year anniversary video, of course, NUHCS is committed to deliver specialized, dedicated cardiovascular health care, as well as providing expert education on health heart, or heart health rather, it's all part of that commitment. We're going to see that in action today. What I like about an event like this is the experts from NUHCS have highlighted the key heart health and heart disease issues that you need to know about for this year. For example, today we're going to be taken on a journey covering topics as varied and wide as, as exploring the vessels of your lung and the disease that can affect that and how, if treated early, I mean, we don't want to treat it late because it can lead to high mortality rates. We're going to learn about the importance of women's heart health and how it can present and look very different from what might happen for a man in terms of the manifestation of a heart attack, for instance. And we're also going to be taking a look at the vast importance of understanding that not only are you aging, but your vessels are aging as well. How does this impact heart disease, stroke risk, and more? And if we all take a big step back, the other point that's being highlighted today is if we want to prevent heart attack, if we want to prevent stroke, we have to understand hypertension and stop it there at that case if we can. So these are the four main areas that we're going to be covering and that have been highlighted for today's event. So shall we go on that journey? To those of you who've just walked in, thank you so much. Sorry for the long queue outside. I appreciate each and every one of you coming in. If you don't mind, just make sure that your devices are on silent as well. Let's get this show on the road. So as promised, I want to talk a, lot, a little bit about what's happening in the lung blood vessels. Our first speaker is going to develop on the concept of pulmonary hypertension. Now the worrying thing about this is when uh, something happens, it might be in some cases, worse outcomes than certain cancers, if not managed and treated and prevented properly. We're going to find out what we can do and what's the latest on it. Please welcome to the stage the Centre Director for NUHCS, Associate Professor James Yip. Thank you, Danny. Testing. Wow, it's, it's great to have so many people here. This is our first English symposium after COVID, and I'm so glad that people are able to come here and meet in person. Uh, I am going to talk about pulmonary hypertension because uh, my anchor speaker, the last speaker for today, Prof Tan, will be talking about the normal hypertension. Okay, So I, I hope none of you have this bad condition because pulmonary hypertension is one of the conditions that leads to high mortality. And, and before the turn of the millennia, not much was actually known about this condition. And even worse, there wasn't any treatment for this condition at all. So people just died. Uh, if we just look at this, what is pulmonary hypertension? We are all aware of the usual hypertension where we take up a BP set, we stick it on our arm and then we measure a pressure. But what is in pulmonary hypertension is that we have to measure the pressures that occur in your lung. We know that we have a left heart and a right heart. The left heart pumps blood out to all the organs and we can measure that pressure. But in pulmonary hypertension, the pressures are inside our lung. 
And this causes our right heart not to have any uh, ability to pump against that pressure and leads to failure of the heart. In normal high blood pressure, we always call it the silent killer because a lot of people have it but don't have much symptoms. Uh, pulmonary hypertension is different. It has symptoms, but a lot of the symptoms are not very obvious. And what is the definition of pulmonary hypertension? That's when we have a mean pressure in the lung that's more than 20. And how do we measure this? It's quite hard to measure. The way to measure it accurately is to put a catheter into your lung and measure that direct pressure. Uh, but we have some tricks and tips that we can screen for this using echo. And I'll talk to you a little bit about it, how we pick up this disease, how we suspect you have this disease. Now, why is it important? You, you're all here because, you, you know, um, we hope not to have these terrible diseases. But pulmonary hypertension until the last millennia was having a mortality rate as bad as certain cancer. Now, now the reason why I, uh, I, I compare with cervical cancer because the usual sufferers of this disease, 80% of them are women. And they can affect women from very young, from childhood, all the way to old age. We used to say that we see this only in young women, but now we know this is a disease that affects the whole spectrum of age. But it is mainly women, 80% are women, 4 to 1 are women. Uh, and the mortality rate is about 50% in five years. That means, how do you interpret these curves is that if you look at five years, how many people are alive, it's about 50%. And this is almost the same as cervical cancer between uh, stage two and three, where people also die of, even with the best treatments available nowadays. Okay, so that is the importance of this condition. Now, what symptoms do you get when you have pulmonary hypertension? Uh, so I mentioned that the usual hypertension is a silent cut, but this one actually has symptoms. And if you do pick it up early enough, you would be able to look at these pressures. And the symptoms that people will have will be very generic, like breathlessness when you take a walk, tiredness all the time, looking blue in the face and the lips and the hands, and giddiness and fainting spells. Uh, that sounds like a lot of us, actually. <laughs> so how do you know? When these symptoms are persistent or not quite the usual that we have, uh, that's when you need to see somebody. All of us feel this way, but how do you tease it out? Uh, if we are an athlete and we could use to be able to run five kilometers, if suddenly one day we, we can't do it, there's something wrong with our bodies. But if this has been going for years and years, uh, then again, this is something that you might want to look into, especially if you're concerned about symptoms. Other than those symptoms, there are other symptoms which uh, you know, come. Uh, this includes uh, chest pain, and that could also be blockage of your heart arteries, uh, dizziness, fainting spells are usually very ominous. So anyone who has a fainting spell doesn't wake up, you wake them up, they're on the floor, they, uh, then these are things you have to look at. One of my first patients that I saw was an NUS 18-year-old student. Uh, who presented to the ENT surgeon with hoarseness of his voice, of her, of her voice. And she also had pulmonary hypertension. And this is due to the fact that the arteries in the lung are big and compressed against the nerve to the voice. So this, uh, this girl spoke, oh, you know, very low hoarse voice. No good reason. And only when we investigated further, oh, it's due to this condition. Uh, but the majority of people will have just shortness of breath on exertion. 86% will just have shortness of breath on exertion. And if it's a young person, okay, should be fit, you know, can do IPPT and that sort of thing, and suddenly cannot, especially if it's a woman, uh, then there's something wrong. You, you do need to look at it, you know, because by the time you have leg swelling or any of the late symptoms, uh, it's probably an advanced problem. Why do people with pulmonary hypertension get breathlessness or exertion? Well, if you look inside the heart and the lungs, we have a right heart, the right heart pumps blood to the lungs. And if for whatever reason, the blood flow to the lungs are affected, that means the arteries are narrowed. You know, and this is just not narrowing in one place, but almost all the arteries of the lungs. Then the right heart has to pump against great resistance in order to uh, be able to deliver oxygen to oxygenate, you know, give air oxygen into your blood so that when it comes to the left side of the body, this can be pumped throughout the whole body. So these are the arteries in the lung, very small arteries, usually the medium-sized arteries. And if that narrowing is occurring in all the lung arteries, as in pulmonary hypertension, uh, then that blood flow is decreased. Occasionally, you also get clots in these lungs uh, formed because the flow is sluggish. And some of these patients do need to take also blood thinners. 
So that's why they feel breathless on exertion. So it's a lung artery problem. It's not so much the it can also be a lung problem, but together people get these problems. So unexplained sudden limitations of exercise capacity in someone who is otherwise fit needs to be investigated. Okay, so that is actually one of the key messages today. Now, what do we see as doctors when you see us? Usually, when you see these signs, it is late. Uh, when the right heart fails, you get water accumulating in your tummy. There's water there, what we call ascites. Uh, you get an enlargement of liver, and in advanced cases, your liver can also fail. You get swelling of the legs, and uh, that's a common cause of people seeing cardiologists as well. Uh, and pulmonary hypertension is one of those things that we need to exclude. You have raised veins in the neck. And when it's very bad, your oxygen levels, you have all these nice little pulse oximeters from thermostat holdings. Uh, yes, if that is low, we need to look for it as well. How do we classify these problems? Well, uh, there are various classifications, but I, I will just look at the word just below the word group. It can be due to the blood vessel problem, as we've showed you, narrowing. It can be due to the heart problems. And end-stage uh, hypertension, the usual one that we talk about, can cause diastolic heart failure, which also causes pulmonary hypertension. It can be due to lung problems itself, you know, sleep apnea. I think you've attended some of our talks on it. And it also can be due to blockages of the heart arteries due to pulmonary embolism. So pulmonary embolism is when people sit on a, econ we call it economy class syndrome. Uh, that's when you sit on a plane, sit on a plane for many hours, then you get clots in your legs, these clots fly into your lung. Uh, most of them will resolve with no issues with on treatment, but 7% of them will lead to long-term pulmonary hypertension if you're not careful. And then finally, multifactorial reasons, and a lot of cancers are in that category. How do we treat them based on the group? There are drugs to treat the vessel problem. The heart problem can be treated to solve this problem. The lung problem can be treated to solve this problem. And of course, we can do surgery in the lungs or balloon these block arteries and lungs to solve the block artery problem. And of course, some of the multifactorial groups, other medicines or lung transplantation is the only way to fix. So you look at this list, a lot of cancers, uh, renal failure, weird diseases, and that miscellaneous group. So, uh, the way I explain it to my patients is that, you know, any bad condition that you have, like cancer, kidney, liver disease, if you have pulmonary hypertension, on top of those diseases, your prognosis is very bad. Very, very bad. So, something that you don't want to eat. Why do people have this problem? It's got to do with a bit of the genes and the environment. People have these abnormalities on the genes. This is a classic example of a mutation called BMPR2. Some of us have it. Not everyone has pulmonary hypertension once you have this gene. There's something in the environment that activates this gene, sometimes late in life, that causes you to suddenly get pulmonary hypertension. You can be well through your life, then you meet something in your diet, in the atmosphere, or medical condition. That you have. It turns on this gene, and it makes your arteries in the lung from small to thick. Uh, and there are many, many genes that we are looking at, even in NUHCS, that uh, cause these other things. And sometimes it can be conditions that you get that causes these arteries to change. They constrict and become narrow, and then you get this problem. Uh, this is just a quick video to show you what happens in the, heart art, uh, in the lung arteries. It's made of three layers where the blood flows through. You have an inner layer, what we call the adventitia. You have a middle layer with uh, muscles and uh, smooth muscles. And then, of course, there are fibroblasts outside of these arteries. And each of these layers contribute to the activation of these genes that cause this kind of narrowing and makes things bad. I'm going to skip the rest of this animation because it's just going to show you uh, something nice like this, but uh, usually got nothing more to say. <laughs> so this is exactly what happens in the arteries in each of the groups. But one I want to point to is the last group. In severe pulmonary hypertension, these abnormal vessels can even grow up to be like, you know, like a cancer cell, you know. These are called plexiform lesions and it behaves like a cancer. So it just doesn't cause narrowing, but it, it just becomes mad and grows like crazy. And, and that is why some of these conditions are almost as bad as cancer. In fact, uh, new research has shown that we are now using some cancer drugs to even treat this condition. What are the causes? Uh, I mentioned to you that it can be due to people with holes in the heart, congenital heart disease. It be, can be caused by portal hypertension. In fact, uh, close to 10% uh, of my patients with end-stage liver failure, meaning from hepatitis B, alcohol, will have pulmonary hypertension. Remember I said bad condition plus pulmonary hypertension equals worse prognosis. And then finally, there are many things in our environments like stimulants. Uh, a lot of it are illicit drugs, cocaine, amphetamines. But I'll point out some common items that, you know, that we may even take 
that could cause pulmonary hypertension. But, you know, like I said, lots of people may take these things, but suddenly you have abnormal gene, activates the abnormal gene, and something bad happens. Getting HIV is also one of those AIDS. It's also one of those conditions that may activate people with these genes to have uh, pulmonary hypertension. And lastly, this is a worm disease that we don't see in Singapore, but mainly in Africa. Just to show you that some of the common compounds that have been associated with causing pulmonary hypertension, uh, I want to show you these man-made epidemics of pulmonary hypertension that has occurred before. In 1969, those, I think a lot of you will be from 1969, my own generation around this time, we had this slimming drug called Aminorex that was oh, damn good, it made you lose weight, look good. Uh, but then you can see the, the, the bar charts from very low levels of pulmonary hypertension, suddenly a hell of a lot of people got it, you know. And then they found out that, oh, it's this slimming drug. Not that it happened once, it happened twice. In fact, in 1994, not so long ago, a new slimming drug on Time magazine uh, called Fenfen. Okay? So this, was, uh, this drug was marketed as Redox. Okay? And again, wow, they said, miracle drug, people lost weight. And then what happened? We had another epidemic. You can see in 1995, another peak. And they realised that it's bad, we better stop. So the drug, was, but it took years for these drugs to be withdrawn. And I think up to now, you can still get some versions of these drugs available. Uh, happened on a big scale also in Spain. This is someone made adulterated uh, olive oil in Spain. Okay? And, and this became what we call toxic rapeseed poisoning. And they distributed it to uh, lots of people. 3,000 people in that area of, of Spain developed pulmonary hypertension-like symptoms. 300 of them died. You know? So again, that story of things. What are the, some of the things that are now potentially able to do? Uh, uh, if you look at the list under possible uh, St. John's Ward, this is a common uh, English drug used for uh, treating depression. Uh, Qing Dai, which is used to treat bowel problems. Uh, you can buy it on uh, Amazon. <laughs> I, I just looked it up. It's on Amazon. You can buy it. Lots of people take it. Usually no problem. But again, if you have that abnormal gene, you take something in the environment, it activates it then you get this problem. Some of them get better after you stop the drug, but a lot of them don't. How do you look for pulmonary hypertension? Well, simple things will be x-rays, ECGs. So these are things that your doctor can do. And if they are abnormal, uh, then they send it to us as cardiologists to look at it. And what do we do? We do this thing called echo. Echo is a non-invasive scan using ultrasound. Looking at the heart, uh, we point these ultrasound waves. That's this probe that we have. We look at your heart. We show signs that your right heart is stressed up. We can even measure that pressure, you know, but not that accurately, but it gives us an idea as to how high those pressures are in your lung. And then once you've we picked up, hey, you're a high candidate that you have pulmonary hypertension, then we have to do even more tests on you to find out what could be the cause and then treat that cause and then uh, get back to you. So that's ECHO, and I think uh, this is something that some of you may have seen before. So I'm, I'm not going to show you that. What are the tests that we do? We do lung tests uh, to check whether it's a, due to that lung problem. We do a VQ scan that looks for the clots in the lung. We do a lot of blood tests to see whether you've got certain diseases. Of course, CD scanners, uh, one of the last few tests to screen the lung, look for clots and things like that. A test that uh, I think some of you may have, but we try not to do this test for everyone because there's radiation. So this is not a screening test. If you want a screening test, we start with ECG, chest X-ray, physical examination. Come to see a cardiologist, we do an echo, say whether you're high likelihood, low likelihood. If you're low likelihood, very good. You probably don't have this problem. And then what can we do? Uh, this is someone with pulmonary hypertension. Then we do this thing called a cardiac catheterization. Remember, the gold standard is to stick a tube into the heart, into the lung, measure the pressures, uh, and then say, yes, you have. And why is this an important step? A lot of people say, oh, you've already done it on echo. Why do you need to stick a catheter in my heart to prove that? And that's because the treatment of pulmonary hypertension is very expensive. And also, you need to have a you need to be absolutely sure which of the causes that I mentioned earlier. Is it due to a blood vessel problem? Is it due to a heart problem? So sometimes it is hard to tell the difference and the cath is the one because if you're going to be subjected to lifelong expensive therapy for the heart and for your lung blood vessels, uh, then you need to be able to do this correctly and, and cath is probably the way to do it. So you have to put the tube in. So I, I'm going to skip a lot. There. What, what treatments could you have? There are treatments like oxygen, diuretics to pass urine to get rid of fluid. And then these drugs that we have. And then finally, lung transplantation is the last hope. I'm showing you this slide because it is expensive. 
okay? Uh, some of you may be very clever and say, hey, that's a drug that I know, Viagra. <laughs> yes, I, I'm the number one prescriber of Viagra in, in NUH. Uh, and they're mainly women. They take it three times a day, <laughs> okay? And, and this is not for men uh, who use it for erectile dysfunction. These are for women, life-saving drugs. And it's not cheap. Thankfully, it's now generic, but still not cheap. Then you've got these other drugs, and you can see the price. Why am I showing you the price? Because I'm telling you, when you're young, or if your children are young, buy critical illness insurance, because it is in the fine print. When you buy these 20-odd terrible conditions that you could potentially get, pulmonary hypertension is one of them, and they will pay up 100, 200,000 the minute this diagnosis is made. So I, I'm going to finish up my talk here to say that, hey, have we done better from no treatment to all this wonderful treatment? Yes, we have. And this is work that we've done in NUHCS and we're very proud of that we have doubled the life expectancy of these people from 50% five years to 50% 10 years. That's a doubling. And for these people, it makes a difference, you know, to be able to live longer. So with that, we've talked to you about the symptoms. We've showed you that the causes that could potentially come about from this condition. And then lastly, how you make the diagnosis and of course, how do we treat this illness? So with that, I, I leave you that picture of pulmonary hypertension. Important condition is the other hypertension that no one talks about, but hopefully you have a better idea on what it is now. So with that, Daniel, I hand it back to you. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you so much, Professor. I'm messaging my insurance agent right now after this, just to double check that the critical insurance coverage is there. That was great. Did, did you know a lot about pulmonary hypertension? Were you all aware of it? You know, we all hear about the other kind of hypertension, and we'll talk about it later. So it's great to have that insight and that breathing issue that turns up. I know it's very terrifying for a lot of people. So now we know, forewarned, and that's what the heart truth is all about, pinpointing these heart topics and heart disease topics for each and every one of us that we can go back and spread and tell our families about and learn more about as well. Now, just a quick reminder, we're going to have a little bit of fun later today. I'm going to be giving out $200 worth of N2C vouchers to some local people. In total, I have total $200, well, not, not each, uh, $200 of N2C vouchers. That's coming up at the end of the seminar, so make sure you hang out for that. You're also going to walk away later on. You've got the goodie bags already, you'll notice. You know, last time people used to waste a lot of time lining up outside for goodie bags. So I'm very thankful that the Heart Truth has said, you know what, we're going to put it at the chairs. You've got the goodie bag, all good. But they're also going to give out a lovely bento for each and every one of you later on the way out. So make sure you grab that. And uh, they've got their wonderful sponsor, Marigold, to have some HL milk uh, distributed for you guys as well. It's going to be packed into some cooler bags and distributed to you on the way out as well. So once again, thank you for joining us at The Heart Truth. It's the 15-year anniversary of NUHCS. And this next topic is something very close to heart for me. I first started talking about it many years ago on my radio show. And in fact, just last week, many of you might have heard our speaker on my radio show on Health Matters on CNA 938 talking about this very topic, and that is women's heart health. And why am I so passionate about it? Because I feel that we in the media have been part of the problem by promulgating this image of a man grabbing his chest and clutching over and feeling a heart attack. And, and we think that that's what it looks like. But it doesn't for a woman in many cases. And we're going to find out how women's heart health needs to be looked at differently and understood differently so that we can pick up the symptoms early. And I want to make sure that men and women alike are both aware of these symptoms so that we can all look out for each other. So please welcome to the stage consultant from the Department of Cardiology at NUHCS and recent guest on Health Matters as well, Dr. Sim Hui Wen. Hi. Uh, good, good morning, everyone. So um, this talk, as uh, Daniel just said, is not just for women. Uh, for men, if you have any women in your life, this talk is for you as well. So uh, let's go to the first myth of facts. Uh, can I have a raise of hand? Who here thinks that heart disease is a man's disease? No one? <laughs> because they know that this is uh, all on myths of heart disease. So yes, uh, I think maybe our group is a well-informed group as well. So OK. Um, Look at this picture. So when you see this, what is the first reaction? <laughs> Call the ambulance now, right? He's having a heart attack. But if you see this picture, mm, <laughs> so maybe try to relax a bit more. You look stressed. 
Maybe it's just gastric problem, like, you know, just, uh, just uh, do less work or something. So, women and men can have very different symptoms of heart disease. For a man, it feels like um, this is the typical uh, symptoms of heart disease where they feel a heavy pressure on the chest, as if something heavy is pressing on it, and it can radiate to the left arm, and sometimes they have cold sweats. Women can have these symptoms as well, but it's more common in men. So in women, how does a heart attack look like? So they can have vague symptoms like upper body pain, nausea, shortness of breath, cold sweats, lightheadedness, or some dizziness and unusual fatigue. And um, these symptoms, um, sometimes the women themselves, even if they have um, this kind of symptoms, they tend to downplay their symptoms, or they, they are too busy to seek help. They just dismiss the symptoms, and sometimes probably because of they're afraid, so they're afraid to, to go and see a doctor for those because they think that maybe there's nothing and then the doctor may think they're crazy or something. So it's not true that a cardiovascular disease is not just a man's disease. You can see this, this is a chart of the number of heart disease uh, in men and women in the US. So you can see that um, throughout the different age group, 20, 40, 60, and 80, actually it's quite comparable. Men is in the blue and women is in the red. So Throughout the age group, actually heart disease is comparable between men and women. So it's not just a man's disease. And then this is a, this is a study that was conducted in Canada, around 45,000 patients. And uh, the one in the blue is men, and the one in red in, is women. So they follow up this patient for around 12 years after a heart attack. And what can you see? Um, as, um, as the time goes by, you can see that Men, uh, women, are more likely to die or get heart failure after a heart attack. So you can see, as you know, this graph, the lower part shows that you have a higher likelihood of death or getting heart failure. And not only that, they, from this study, they also found out that when women get admitted for heart failure, they are less likely to be seen by a cardiologist. That's one thing. And they are less likely to receive appropriate treatment and also they are less likely to get definitive treatment like balloon stenting or bypass surgery. And women, when they present with heart attack, they have more complicated history, uh, background history as compared to men. And also they usually present 10 years later than men. So if a man gets heart disease at 50, usually women get it at 60 years old. Okay, so let's go to the second um, facts or beef. So who here thinks that breast cancer kills more women? No one, <laughs> because they know this is a heart disease. So uh, uh, who here thinks that heart disease kills more women? Can I have a raise of hand? <laughs> so I think uh, maybe because of all the talks that we are having, so there's a more awareness um, uh, regarding heart disease in women. So this is the, the, the information from the registration of death from Singapore. So for three years, you can see this is 2019, 2020, and 2021. And the one in red is the cardiovascular disease. So when you say cardiovascular disease, it means heart, any heart disease, any heart disease related to hypertension or stroke. And then this is any cancer combined, this one in blue, and breast cancer is the one in pink. So you can see that every year consistently for the past few years and the year before, um, heart disease actually kills six times more than breast cancer every year. But of course, um, women are very, very good at doing like uh, self-breast screening mammogram because of the campaign that was running for years. And I mean it's good because breast cancer mortality, um, breast cancer death rate has been declining over the years. But of course we cannot ignore this. Cardiovascular disease is also is very important and even more important than breast cancer. So women have to look after their heart. So like what I mentioned, Cardiovascular disease actually kills six times as many women as breast cancer. And from a survey that was done a few years ago, only one out of 10 Singaporeans know that actually heart disease is the top killer in women. So I think now in this group of, I mean in this group of audience, we know that at least everyone knows that this is not true, all right? And this is the global burden of heart disease in women. So you can see worldwide, 35% of death in all women is caused by heart disease, and 8.9 million of deaf um, women actually died from uh, heart disease in 2019. 
So cardiovascular disease among women is understudied, underrecognized, underdiagnosed, and undertreated. This is, a, this is a syndrome where it's used to describe underdiagnosis of heart disease in women. It's called the Yentil syndrome. Basically, Yentil is this fictional character that was uh, portrayed by Barbara Streisand. That was, uh, I think, 10, 20 years ago. So it's actually a character where a woman has to de disguise as a man to attend the school to study uh, Talmud. Talmud is basically like Jew Jewish law. And then this doctor, Dr. Bernardin, in 1991, she published an article in one of the prestigious journals, which is a New England Journal of Medicine. She said that being just like a man historically has been a price that women has to pay for equality. And women has been treated less equally in political, social relation, business, education, research, and also healthcare. So this is to bring awareness that we have to also uh, emphasize the importance of heart disease in women. So next one is the third myth. So heart disease pattern is the same for men and women. Um, I will answer this, actually it's different. So when they look at the arteries of uh, men and women with heart disease, you can see that in the women, um, you have this generalized narrowing, long narrowings of the artery. But the heart disease in men, usually you get this localized blockage. But of course, it can happen, uh, both condition vice versa can happen in the different gender as well. And then um, this, is, this, is, this is the arteries of the heart. So this is the big arteries of the heart where we can see. And then when we do an angiogram, this is what we see. These are the big arteries of the heart. But what we cannot see 95% of the time, these are what we call microcirculation. So these are all the small capillaries network in the heart that you can't see any, cons this is responsible for 95% of the circulation of the heart. And usually for epicardial disease, this is what the large vessel is more common in men. And for microcirculation, it is more common in female. It can happen in men as well, but it's more common in female. So this is what happened when the, this artery, there's, you can see there's a narrowing here, and when the narrowing gets clogged up, so that's when you have heart attack. But in the microcirculation disease, sometimes the symptoms are very subtle, and then the test to test for microvascular dysfunction is actually um, a specialized test. So usually it often go underdiagnosed. So these are some of the heart disease that are more common in women that I'm just going to elaborate a bit about. So the first one is called spontaneous artery, uh, coronary artery dissection. It occurs in 90% of women. So what happens is that this is a normal artery with normal blood flow, and there's a small tear here. And when the tear gets bigger and bigger, it blocks the blood flow to the heart, and also there's a clot that forms here. So when the clots get bigger, it can actually completely block the artery. So it can lead to heart attack and sudden death. And this condition can occur during pregnancy or just after childbirth. And uh, we have to be aware of that. Okay. The next one is what we call a broken heart syndrome or Takotsubo disease. Maybe some of you have heard of it before. So this is our heart. You can see this is a right heart. This is a left heart. So the left heart is in charge of pumping blood to the, uh, the whole our, our body. So what happens is that usually it occurs in 90% of women, postmenopausal, more common, and it's usually triggered by either emotional stress or physiological stress, like if you heard a bad news or you had a, like a major event, like a surgery or something. So there's a surge of hormones, and then it causes the heart to, to weaken. Uh, so this is a heart where it contracts normally. You can see that well contract. These are the muscle of the heart that contracts well. And these are the, this is a heart where you have broken heart disease, so, so it doesn't contract here, so the heart became weak. So this is, why is it called takosubo? Because this shape is just like a um, uh, Japanese uh, octopus trap, so they call this tako is uh, the octopus and then subo is the trap. So that's why we, they call this takosubo syndrome. Okay, and the next one is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Actually, this condition is quite common in women. There are two types of heart failure. The first type of heart failure is called um, the systolic dysfunction, where you have weakened heart muscle. So you can see that the heart is dilated and the muscle is thin and weak. So this condition is more common in men and usually caused by large vessel disease like what I described just now. And then th you have the other kind of heart failure, which is called the diastolic dysfunction. So this diastolic dysfunction, you can see the heart muscle is thick, the left ventricle is small, and usually this is because there's a failure to relax in the heart. And 
This is more common in women and usually is caused by vas microvascular disease. And uh, usually it occurs in older women who have a lot of medical problems. So not only that, as I mentioned, a lot of women are underrepresented in trials. So with, in this condition, we can see that historically, even in all the trials, only 20 to 25% of women are represented. So most of the time, there's still no effective treatment for this condition. Okay, so the, third, uh, the fourth myth, heart disease does not affect young women. This is not true. Okay, you can see that in this picture, this is uh, Lisa Marie Presley. Recently, I think in January, she passed away from cardiac arrest. She's only 54 years old, and she has a family history of cardiac arrest because her dad died of cardiac arrest as well. This is the hospital admission for heart attack in women less than 55 years old. You see, in the past, 1995 to 1999 is only 21%, but in 2020 onwards, 31% of young women were ad admitted for heart disease. In uh, women, we, we have estrogen to protect us from heart disease when we are younger. Estrogen actually helps to regulate the heart cholesterol and also uh, relax the blood vessel. That's why the uh, risk of heart disease in the younger women is lower. But once you reach, reach menopause, women actually have the same risk of heart disease than men, uh, as compared to men. So, but then, even if so, you are to not totally immune for heart disease. Younger women can get heart disease as well. So this is one of my patients, she is only 30 years old, she has hyperlipidemia and she came, with she came to the hospital with chest pain. So you can see this is a block here, it's a block artery here, we perform an angiogram immediately and then there's a block artery. So here it is and then we immediately perform a balloon and stenting procedure for her okay, and manage to restore her blood flow. But you can see even here there's a lot of extensive you see, a lot of sensitive diffuse narrowing that we can't do much about, so she has to be on aggressive medical therapy. So even 30 or so women nowadays, we're seeing younger and younger women getting heart disease. So it's not, we can't ignore this anymore. Okay, so what can you do? So first thing, you need to know your risk factors. They are the common risk factors that we all know, hypertension, obesity, smoking, lip, hyperlipidemia, sedentary lifestyle, diabetes. These are all, I mean, even for men, it's the same. But there are some sex-specific risk factors that we have to know. So if you have some, um, like when doing pregnancy, pregnancy complication like gestational diabetes, hypertension, preterm delivery, you can have higher risk of getting heart disease in the future. So you have to scream that early. So if you have this kind of pregnancy complication in the young, when you are younger, you have to be aware that you have increased risk of heart disease in the future. And there are these unrecognized, under-recognized risk factors such as psychosocial risk factors, poverty, poor health literacy, all these predispose women to heart disease. Okay, so let's look at the thing that you can control. So heart disease is actually 80% preventable. So we have to focus on this. How do we do it? You have to manage your blood pressure, drink less alcohol, have healthy lifestyle, check your sugar, check your lipids, healthy weight. All these are the same thing we repeat over and over again. When you see your cardiologist, they'll tell you the same thing every time. So exercise more, it benefits your heart. It doesn't just reduce heart disease. It also reduces the risk of cancer and diabetes as well. And then just a short one because we are living in a stressful environment in Singapore. How to reduce stress for heart health, exercise regularly, try to get outdoors, don't use your phone too much, okay, unplug for technology, reconnect with your friends, enough sleep, sleep at least seven hours a day, relaxation technique like meditation, pr practice mindfulness, find a hobby, you know, usually for retiree, try to do something like, you know, outdoor activities or like do some plants or something, okay, self-care and then if you really need mental uh, seek help if you really need it. Okay, and go for a, a screening at least once a year. Blood pressure, cholesterol, sugar, BMI, and waist are these are the numbers that you are looking at. Okay, and then it's happy to say that okay. So this is the chart that shows the death rate of cardiovascular disease in the U.S. As you can see. So from 1970 for male, it has been on a declining trend because there has been measures to help the men. But for women, you can see from 1970 to late 1990s, it has been on upward trend. But from the late 1990s to 2000, there was a lot of initiative for women's hearts. So you have all these uh, groups of, of research and heart centers specialized for women and also have guidelines that are tailored to women and campaigns such as Go Red for Women. So you can see from this year onwards, actually the mortality rate is on a downward trend. So there's still hope. What about in Singapore, uh, our, I mean in NUH itself, we have our women's heart team. 
And then we also have a women's heart clinic that's tailored to women, looking at different conditions that is a female phenotype of heart disease. And we also have a health, health coach on board that will help uh, patients um, with lifestyle modification. And then we also have educational videos on YouTube where you can find. And we give public talks as well. And also the goal rate for women in Singapore. So the take home message is that all these are myths and heart disease is not just a man disease. Heart disease kills more women than breast cancer. Heart disease pattern is different for men and women and heart disease do affect young women. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sim. We are halfway through our journey. I told you that there are four topics that have been highlighted by the team of experts at NUHCS. So we've learned about pulmonary embolism, and we've learned about the vast importance of understanding women's heart health as well. I know many of you might have specific questions about these conditions. Rest assured, we have catered a 15-minute Q&A segment coming up at the end, uh, where we'll have microphones going through the crowd. Bring those questions fast and furious. That's free medical advice, free consultation. Right? Start writing it down now. I wrote one down already. Uh, in the next segment, uh, well, I want to take our attention away from the first two topics and let's start understanding something which is very important to wrap our head around because unfortunately the mortality rate from um, one of the complications of what we're going to be discussing is very, very high. We're going to be learning about what can happen to the blood vessels of your body as you're aging because apparently they're aging as well. And if you've heard of something as serious as an aortic rupture, I've talked about it on many of my shows as well, it's worrying because mortality rates can be extremely high. Can we prevent this? Can we get this under control? Finding out next on today's edition, as we bring on to the stage, Senior Consultant from the Department of Cardiac, Thoracic and Vascular Surgery at NUHCS. Please welcome Dr. Vitali Sorokin. Uh, thanks for coming today. So today, uh, I try not to give too much medical knowledge to you. You are not planning to make your doctor. But uh, w what I am trying to do, I, I try to talk today about what affect all of us, affect you, affect me, affect Martin as well. So we all age. So and uh, and specifically today, we will talk about aging our, our vessel. As you know. Uh, our vessel is a very important structure. It provides blood to all parts of our body. But uh, today we're going to talk about aorta. Aorta is a main artery, which is goes in the center of our body. And we call it sometimes tree of life because it gives all branches and supply all organs in the system. And uh, as you can see here, it's uh, situated just in the center of our body, just next to our spine. So, and that's why it's important because beware of your back pain because sometimes your back pain is not your spine, sometimes it's something related to your artery. So, it, it, this is a normal artery under microscope. As you can see, there's many layers of collagen and elastin. It has uh, proteins which make it very elastic, dispense, distensible. And it's actually built to last for a long time. So this artery pump about 100 millions of liters of blood over the lifetime. It's not only a simple passive pipe, it's also helped to pump the blood through because it generates the pulse wave which help pushing the blood through the uh, other rest of the body. Another thing that is important is also can sense if our pressure is very high and it can generate special uh, biological molecules which help us to control our blood pressure. So uh, over the period of our life, so this artery, main, main artery, aorta, is at a constant stress. So it's a mechanical stress, degenerative inflammatory stress, atherosclerotic disease. Let's start with mechanical one. So mechanical one, it's our pressure, it's our uh, strenuous exercise it is our stress. We generate uh, pressure on the artery. It might break through. All this nice, beautiful structure might start to degenerate. Once it degenerates, form the scar, artery wall gets weaker. 
Similar concept happening here, but inflammation is involved. We will talk about inflammation a bit later. We do have this inflammatory pattern in some of us, especially people who have arthritis or some systemic inflammatory disease. So atherosclerotic disease we all know about. Uh, let's talk one by one. So once your aorta wall get very weak at degenerative, what will happen? Few things might happen. This is a probably most dangerous one. This is the one Martin just mentioned about, about mortality is very high. So once artery get torn inside, blood goes inside the wall. This is how it looks under microscope. So your wall gets uh, twice thinner compared to it's supposed to be. This is what's supposed to be, and this is what you get uh, at after dissection. And you form two lumen in the wall, in the artery. Some might say, oh, two better than one, but it's not the case because this part becomes thinner. It's uh, exponentially increase in size and my rupture any time. So, and for this condition, patients might, once you have it, it's usually acute setting, and patients who have 1% mortality per hour means in two days, 50% might not be around anymore. So, uh, another condition which is more chronic, so this is uh, as we saw picture before, this is how artery looks like, but this is how artery looks after it starts to degenerate, <laughs> It accumulates a lot of things, try to protect the system, but it doesn't work because there is no strong supporting extracellular matrix here. We call it degenerative disease. And aorta start to get dilated in the thorax or in your abdomen. So it, it, it can affect any part of your artery. So Last but not least, we all know about atherosclerotic disease, we know about heart attack and stroke, but main artery is not exception because it's also get affected. Once your lipids start to accumulate inside the wall, wall become very rough and clot my sits on it. And this area where the lipids are, wall is very weak, it's, it's my uh, protrude outside and we call it ulcer. You know, there's a stomach ulcer. This is an aortic ulcer. So when once it's protruded, it's become weak, and it might even burst or rupture. So the thing is, uh, this disease is, is not well known as a stroke and heart attack because main uh, presentation usually once we have complications and patients usually very sick. So it's usually started with. Uh, acute pain if patients have complication, some blood disruption to either to the brain, to the heart, or to your low limbs. So it's compressed uh, surrounding structures. Patients might have shortness of breath and so on. It might be internal bleed, which might be relatively mild, or it can be ruptured with sudden death. So uh, how do we recognize this? Because aorta goes from head to low limbs, and depend which part is get affected. So it's like chameleon different conditions in life. For example, if it's happening in our, your abdomen, when you have abdominal pain, it happens in the chest, you might simulate your chest and heart attack. So that's why to recognize this condition is very important. You're seen by right specialist. So can we detect it? Yes. We like to detect it when it's just start to build up, just start to develop, when it just protrude a bit. So we can do simple echo, no pain, and ultrasound of your abdomen so we can see the size and we can see, well, this is something what is not right. And when, if required, we can ask for computer scan or even MRI scan. As Dr. James Reed mentioned, computer is a lot of uh, radiation, but we have another option, which is an MRI. Okay, so can we do something if we detect it in time? Yes, there are few options available. So we can do as simple as stenting, and stent cover the, the weaker part of the artery. It can be open surgery when we replace our aorta, or we can be, uh, which can done through large surgery or minimal access, 
Once in a while, we're able to preserve the part of the artery, so in save the human structure, which can still uh, function well. Or sometimes we do hybrid surgery, where we part them as an open surgery and part them as a uh, minimally invasive stenting. So what we are trying to build here, and uh, it's been functioning for a couple of years, is a, we call it multidisciplinary team. What does it mean? It's something what uh, Martin just mentioned. So you come to see, for example, cardiac surgeon, me, and all your test and scan will be discussed from vascular surgeon, radiologist, anesthetist, and so on. Whole team will be involved to make decisions for one patient. So why is this important? Because uh, there is no skew uh, uh, or cardiac surgery, they do cardiac surgery. So we all been involved and you get for one consultation, but you get all these specialists being involved and looking after you. It's probably the best practice. So in other things we have, we have 24 seven service means, uh, I hope it doesn't happen. So if any aortic conditions arise, patients come in, all these uh, specialists are available, even in the middle of the night. So the we can, so we're all here, so we can come and help you, because as, for example, aortic dissection, you need immediate attention. But we don't want to see these patients come to emergency with ruptured aorta, so what we want, we try to uh, build up the program which help us to prevent this condition. So not many things we can do, but uh, of course we can do health screening, which, uh, by the way, are available in uh, here, so I, I can give you contact if you're interested. So we can control your risk factor and of course we manage your lifestyle. So risk factors we can divide the two, one is modifiable and one mm, potentially not modifiable is hypertension, cholesterol, overweight, uh, food. So this is something when you, you've been he here about. So uh, non-modifiable age, we can't change age, right? But there are some anti-aging therapy around, but uh, of course it's not proven at the moment. Let's see, maybe it's developed in a few years. And we do have some genetic therapy for other conditions, but it's not yet available for aortic. So let's see what has come up. So uh, altogether, aortic aging can be uh, presented like this. So it's environment outside us which uh, affect our body, affect our biology as well. Our biology is your age, your genes, and your in inherited conditions, and disease which can be ma managed by doctors. So hypertension, obesity, so chronic kidney disease. So uh, if you ask me, can we detect if our arteries start to age and become not normal? Yes, we can. As you can see, it's quite a busy slide, means it's not that easy, but it's possible. And it, we do have these uh, uh, scans available. So it can be pulse waveform checking, dynamic parameter. It can be structural composition of the artery, which can be checked by some scans. But it can be as simple as blood pressure. Of course, you all do uh, blood pressure checking at home. I guess you are. So, and. Uh, you see what, so recently more and more data, even checking the blood pressure on the arms might not show enough information and you have to look for a parameter called central blood, blood pressure, which can be measured with using specific computer program. So medical therapy, I'm surgeon, so I'm probably not the best person to talk about medical therapy and Prof Tan is gonna give his fantastic talk about hypertension in a few minutes. So cholesterol, medical therapy, and, and blood thinner. So what I want to talk about, uh, what we can do in simple life and simple uh, our every day, so to help us to prevent our uh, vessel to get aged. So controlling your weight. Everybody knows we, uh, overweight is bad, so we know it stress your heart and increase your high blood pressure. Not many of us know, so your overweight, increase your inflammation, increase circulating uh, inflammatory markers inside your blood, which might affect your aging and it much, uh, much, uh, must affect your vessels. So it's also increased cholesterol. 
So we all know about good food, but we should know for sure if we do have access to good food, it's fine. But quantity is uh, also important. It's not the only quality of the food you eat. It's also uh, how much you eat. So you have to be aware of your calorie intake. Another thing that's important is about seafood. This is a probably worst seafood you can take uh, as an example. So because shrimps, crabs, caviar, all these products, very high in cholesterol. If you look for good seafood, it probably should be fish, something like salmon and tuna. Stress, so can we manage our stress? Stress increase our blood pressure. It's promote aging for sure, and there are some studies shows it on a genetic level. So uh, what is important for us, not to avoid the stress all the time, is to understand our limit, how much stress we can take, and manage it in a way so how we can manage it? We control our workload. We try to avoid overwork and stay extra hours. We, we, should, we, we should stick with our family, with friends, with, <coughs> with kids. So it's a uh, draft study which shows that uh, once you are together and you are in a good social environment, it's help with your health. So and re religious might ma help. It doesn't matter what your faith is, So, but if you have uh, belief in common good, and if you, if you meditate in a regular way, so it helps your heart as well. So what about alcohol? You have to be, be, ca be careful with one glass of drink a day, uh, which is your limit. So what's something you have to do? You have to understand, so the alcohol is not the best way to control your stress. So you probably good, should have good wine, when you take it for the good reason, not for the bad reason. And of course, all Hollywood movies shows you all, all heroes and stuff. We start to drink when we are stressed, but it's not the way to go. So I think if you take in alcohol, it's fine, but you should control concentration of your alcohol and amount of alcohol to take, and probably stay around red wine or something light compared to the strong beverage. Okay, regular exercise, important decreased risk of heart condition and including uh, aortic condition, 35 to 40%. But what you have to be aware, you shouldn't sit on your couch and then suddenly you say, okay, it's it, I'm gonna exercise and start to run marathon. So you have to avoid uncustomized exercise. What we uh, have from our patients who come with aortic dissection is that uh, people who suddenly try to be a hero try to do something extra, uh, which we have not done before. We receive these patients once in a while. And uh, especially if you checked, and you know by, by CT scan, your aorta is, get, is getting wider, you have to be very careful with what kind of exercise you do. Check with your doctor, because if it's a mildly dilated aorta, it, it's not a death sentence, you still can exercise. So your aorta reaching critical level, this is a doctor who would advise you probably not to exercise uh, before your condition get fixed. <coughs> Food supplement, we have a lot. If you go to Guardian, or you can see like uh, thousands of bottles. Uh, they are all beautiful, colorful, red, uh, gold, and whatever. So, but uh, I, I must, must disappoint you. So we have different ones. So that we have as simple as like red wine extract with the withdrawal, or we can have, have some drug like uh, antibiotic, which people believe, and some people believe, might help with anti-aging. Anti but the bad news, we don't have any data to show is actually helpful. And please be aware, if you decide to in, in get involved in food supplement, the side effect. So, so and uh, I, I started to search on the, uh, <coughs> on the Medline and what I found, actually collagen, uh, there are a few study meta-analysis which shows it's help you to lean your body, so you make it less fat and decrease your cholesterol and decrease your systolic blood pressure. But the question is where is collagen come from and which one to buy is a big, big question. We, we don't have this evidence. Yeah. So uh, fighting the inflammation. We mentioned inflammation important for your aging and for your arteries. So good news, if you take any statin or you're on statin therapy, so it, it does help with inflammation. 
So this, at least this part is covered. If you are not, so don't worry, even uh, omega and fatty acid like uh, fish oil might help you to, with some inflammatory par parameters if you take it. So, and there's another concept around is anti-inflammatory food. It's People usually use it for arthritis or for joint problem, but it's something that can be, be applied because it's, uh, some food uh, minimizes your inflammation in your body. Of course, it's not a drug and doesn't replace uh, doctor consult or therapy, but it's something you can practice daily and include simple food, including fish and tomato. Okay, so message to take home. Aortic disease can be as devastated as heart attack or stroke. So early diagnosis is a key. We can help you to organize a screening if you like to. So, and something you can do with your lifestyle, and if you want to do it, you please start as early as possible because this aging actually start in about 40s or 50s of years of your life. Okay, so if you have any questions, this is a, uh, you can g give us email and we can very happy to answer you. Thank you very much, Dr. Vitali. Now, I'm sure many of you are more aware, I bet you didn't think about your aortas, did you? Did you know about the aortas and understand it and the idea that there was even a screening package? And when you heard Dr. Vidali talk about the idea of the 24-7 response that's available in a hospital, that's not like to advertise their services. That is to show the severe importance of the round-the-clock treatment that is needed or response that is needed for something like this. Just like you have that with stroke, that's just like you have that with heart attack as well. Now you know how serious it is, the fact that they have that 24-7 response here, that is important to bear in mind. So that's our journey that we've been on, those three major topics. And now to wrap it all up, we need to understand something that affects one in three Singaporeans. This one I think many of you are familiar with. You've heard the term hypertension quite often, but are you paying attention to it? Are you doing anything about it? We may know the word, but the truth is if we know the root issue and understand what we can do to manage, prevent, and learn about the latest that has to do in terms of hypertension management. It could have a big impact in terms of your heart disease risk and stroke as well. Please welcome to the stage Senior Advisor of NUHCS, Professor Tan Hui Ching. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. So this is the 22 years that uh, I'm involved in the NUH Public Symposium, so I'm not sure who has joined me since 2001. But the reason why NUH has been organizing this public symposium year after year is because in this era of fake medical news, I think it's very important that we share with you what is the real medical facts and knowledge so that you can take home with. So what I'm going to talk today is something that is probably very close and personal to every one of you, and you think that you know everything about it. But let me just share with you some of the uh, new information with regard to hypertension. Now, we know that hypertension is really common conditions. I think worldwide it's affecting about 15 to 20% of all adults in the world. Now, in fact, if you look at the... Uh, World WHO report, by 2025, there will be 1 billion people coming down with hypertension, and it is growing at a very fast pace. The number of people with hypertension is actually doubling in the, in the last uh, decade or so. So if you look at the people around here, if you are above the age of 70, 75% of you will have hypertension. All right. So among all the adults here, one in three will have hypertension, whether you know it or you don't know it, but you probably have it in one in three adults. So if you look at Singapore's uh, latest uh, data, 2020, the prevalence of hypertension is 35% in our adults age 18 to 69. And if you're talking about 70 and above, obviously this is going to be much higher and so forth. So in 2016, we started the war against diabetes, if you remember. But our diabetes uh, battle has not been very successful. We feel. So now we better look at hypertension, which is even more common than diabetes itself. So what is hypertension? There is a difference between 
hypertension and high blood pressure. Anybody knows the difference? So if I see a woman, I got excited, my blood pressure goes up. Am I having hypertension? No, right? If you're under stress, you're exercising, you're angry with somebody, you just have a lot of work to be done, your blood pressure go up, is this hypertension? It is not. So I have patients who come and see me, got angry, feel a little bit unwell, check the blood pressure, 200. Came to see a doctor, GP, some of them immediately dispense high blood pressure medicine. So I think there's a difference between hypertension and high blood pressure. So what is actually your blood pressure? Your blood pressure is actually the, a measure of the pressure of the blood against the wall of the artery. And then there are several factors affecting the blood pressure reading. The action of the heart, how fast and how hard it is contracting. The elasticity of the artery wall, the volume and the thickness of the blood all affects blood pressure. So many things can change blood pressure. In fact, your blood pressure is not a single value. It changes every second, every minute. So people are very upset that the blood pressure fluctuates, so to speak. Morning 140, evening 120, they freaked out. So blood pressure is not a single value because it varies with what you're doing, your straits, your state of uh, mental and physical health, your activities, whether you are working, whether you're, whether you're resting, whether you're carrying out physical uh, activity or even dining and drinking, your blood pressure will change. But what causes the blood pressure to change? There are very few. So if you liken your circulatory system, your blood and heart circulatory system to that of a hose and a pipe. So if there's an increase in terms of uh, blood flow because of the uh, heart pumping faster, your blood pressure will go up, right? Or if your hose, which is your artery here, becomes somewhat thickened and the, the hole becomes narrow, your blood pressure will go up. Or for some reason, the amount of blood volume in your body system goes up, your blood pressure will also go up. And that commonly happens in people with end-stage renal failure, where they come past urine and they start bloating up. Of course, the blood pressure is going to go up. So when we say hypertension, it means a persistent elevation of blood pressure. Okay, whether you're resting, whether you're working, daytime, nighttime, stress, not stress, the blood pressure is persistently high. That is hypertension and that is what we need to focus on. Because when you have a persistent elevation of your blood pressure, your entire body system is affected. Every organ is now subjected to a high pressure system. It will affect your brain, heart, kidney, blood vessels. So whole system is affected here. And so what is the cause of this hypertension then? I think broadly we can divide it into two causes. Number one is genetic, so something happening in your gene, it runs in the family and so forth. And the second aspect of which causing blood pressure is actually your lifestyle, the environmental cause. So it's an interplay of the environmental behavioral factors in your gene that ultimately determines whether you have hypertension or not. Okay? Genetic, we can't do very much about it, but environmental, behavioral, lifestyle, we can do a lot about it. So let's talk about it. So what are the types of hypertension? The commonest type of blood pressure or hypertension that we all have is what we call the essential hypertension. That means we don't know what is the cause of the hypertension. We think it's genetic and so forth. And how do I know if you have essential hypertension, there are several characteristics. The people who develop essential hypertension generally have it in the age of between 30 to 50. It's usually a family history of this hypertension. And the onset is gradual, so it goes higher and higher. It doesn't sort of present right away as a 160, 200 sort of a blood pressure reading. So it's usually a mild to moderate blood pressure occurs in an overweight a person with a sedentary lifestyle. Now, there is a small percentage of people with hypertension, less than 10% of them, where the hypertension is actually a secondary, a result of something else that is going on in your body system. Potentially, if I treat that medical condition, I can cure your hypertension. So hypertension is not a curable condition. It is a chronic disease where you're going to be living with it for the rest of your life. But in this small group of patients, potentially you can cure the hypertension. So if they turn out to have some kind of a tumor in the body that is producing hormones that cause the blood pressure to go up, or they have some kind of a narrowing of the kidney artery or major artery, or even having obstructive sleep apnea that you can correct the obstructive sleep apnea, potentially 
you can actually reverse the blood pressure. Now, how do I diagnose hypertension? So there's only one way to do it, and that is to measure it. And the way to measure it is, of course, this thing called a sphygmo manometer. But now we have an automated form of a blood pressure a recorder, which is just as good using oxalometric and so forth. But when you measure blood pressure, commonly we are recording two readings. One, systolic blood pressure, blood pressure at a time when the heart is contracting, diastolic blood pressure, time when the blood pressure is actually relaxing. So when the heart relaxes, your blood pressure don't drop to zero. That's because the elasticity of the wall and so forth ensures that there's always a constant pressure that is driving the blood forward in your body system to supply the organ. So we have two readings for your blood pressure, systolic and diastolic. And we recommend in Singapore that if you're age 18 and above, you should really start checking on your blood pressure. If your blood pressure is normal, then check every two years. But once it's sort of a high normal, then perhaps you should be ch checking it more regularly. But this is the recommendation from the Ministry of Health to check on what are the risk factors, your body weight, blood pressure, blood sugar, and so forth. So we always encourage people to check your own blood pressure. But there are certain important techniques that you, can, uh, you need to observe when you check your own blood pressure. Okay. Number one here is that you have to be relaxed first before you start recording your blood pressure. And I would encourage you to rest for about five minutes, rest your arms on the table first, put the cuff on it and do nothing for five minutes and relax first. Then you want to avoid caffeine, exercise, smoking 30 minutes before your blood pressure measurement. You want to ensure that your bladder is empty so that you're not in some kind of stress and you shouldn't be talking when you are measuring your own blood pressure and so forth and you want to remove any clothing that's uh, covering the uh, location of the calf placement. You need to observe this very simple and yet important techniques in order to record a proper blood pressure. And in terms of the blood pressure set, that's also an important thing. You want to use a device that has been validated. So if you purchase anyone from the NUH pharmacy, that is, uh, they are actually validated. So I'm not here to market any particular brand, but they are supposed to be validated. So you want to rest your arm on the desk. You want to position the cuff at the level right here because it's closest to it's the same level of your heart. And you want to write, use the correct cuff size. So if you're really obese, you, can't, you have to use a much bigger cuff because if you use a small cuff in the big arm, you're going to overestimate the blood pressure. And so, so these are the techniques. So what is normal blood pressure? So this is Ministry of Health guidelines. Unfortunately, it's 2017. We are now six years past and we haven't revised this. But normal blood pressure is less than 130 for systolic, less than 85 for diastolic, according to the Singapore Ministry of Health guidelines. The moment your systolic blood pressure goes 130 to 139, it is not normal anymore. It is high normal, okay? Or 85 to 89. Well, the moment your blood pressure hit 140, for systolic or 90 for diastolic consistently, then that is hypertension. So the Americans have got it different. The Americans got it even more stricter. They say that anything more than 130, 80 is considered hypertension. So that's pretty severe. In their normal blood pressure has to be less than 120 and less than 80. So where do we go from here? In fact, uh, in 2004, when, we, uh, when was, where there was this concept of a uh, high normal blood pressure or so-called pre-hypertension, the uh, medical journalist at that time says that we are creating over-anxiety among our Singaporeans. You know? So way before 140, 90, at 135, 85, you are already at risk. But we said that this is because of the need for people to understand. So I, I rebutted in that year in 2004, so many, many years ago, that this whole idea here of an elevated blood pressure is really to educate you with regard to now taking precaution. Not that you have to start taking medicine right away, but now you have to be mindful of your risk. So when you are young, chances are the hypertension that you're going to be having is the one that is systolic. Okay, So it's the systolic blood pressure that is going to be high when you are young, when you have hypertension. But once you hit the age of 50 to 55, most of the time people don't have a diastolic hypertension anymore. 
it is actually the systolic blood pressure. So young people tend to have diastolic hypertension, old people tend to have a systolic hypertension. Whichever is high is hypertension. So, you know, just checking the blood pressure in the clinic is just not good enough because there are people who come and see me, every time they see me, their blood pressure is high. The moment they walk out, the blood pressure becomes normal. And so that's what we call cleaning hypertension. And that is very difficult for the doctor to actually make a proper assessment and diagnosis of whether this gentleman or our patients have hypertension or not. So now we encourage people to do home blood pressure monitoring, observing the right technique, getting the right device, measure yourself. The more blood pressure reading you record of yourself, the more accurately it depicts the actual trend and the value of your blood pressure. So this is what we call a home blood pressure monitoring. But if you're not capable of doing home blood pressure monitoring, then we put on this cuff for you called ambulatory blood pressure, where this cuff automatically records the blood pressure for you over a 24-hour period of time. So if you can't measure your blood pressure and you want to know whether you have hypertension or not, in a single 24-hour reading, I can assess the average blood pressure load that your body is having and then I can diagnose hypertension or not. So it's what we call a ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. So this is a cuff, so you have to wear for it, wear it for 24 hours. During the daytime, you will activate every half an hour. Once you decide to go to bed, you just press the nighttime mode, you switch to a one hour monitoring. So that you continue to monitor your blood pressure even as you rest. So our definitions for hypertension, for home blood pressure monitoring, and ambulatory blood pressure monitoring is different from clinic hypertension. So in MOH, we say 140, 90 is the cutoff for hypertension. But when we ask you to do your own blood pressure monitoring, the cutoff is actually 135, 85. So this will be a typical sort of a home blood pressure recording that my patient did, uh, checking his blood pressure. And you can see that the average is going to be less than 135, 85. So this is how you diagnose hypertension, either on your own or we do an ambulatory blood pressure. So why do we need to treat hypertension? I think the obvious answer here is that you want to prevent complications of hypertension. Actually, long ago in the 1930s, when hypertension was first discovered, the consensus, the opinion at that time is that hypertension is an important compensatory me mechanism that should not be tampered with or even we already certain that we could control it. There was a famous physician's quoting in the 1930s, leave your hypertension alone because it's something good, it's trying to compensate for something that's not going right with your body system. Another uh, famous physician, Dr. Hay, say the greatest danger to a man with high blood pressure lies in his discovery because then some fool is certain to try and reduce it. Can you imagine? So at that point in time, no treatment for your hypertension is advocated. But we know that hypertension is a silent killer. It causes no symptoms unless complications set in. And that is something that we want to avoid here. And so what is the symptom of hypertension? No symptom. Okay? But, but when you start having symptoms of headache, blurred vision, chest pain, frequent urinations at night, something may suggest that something is going on here as far as complications of hypertension goes. So this is American uh, famous uh, uh, president, Franklin Roosevelt, who presided over the World War II. Franklin Roosevelt actually has got severe hypertension, but there was no treatment at that point in time. If you look at his blood pressure trend on the D-Day itself, it's that high. So you see that his blood pressure is actually going up over the years, and it's always above 200 in the latter years. Okay, so as a result, so not surprisingly, that after this picture was taken shortly, after he actually suffered a fatal hemorrhagic stroke. So he had a bleed in his brain and he died. And so Winston Churchill and Stalin here, so Winston Churchill, who was sitting beside Franklin Roosevelt, made the following observation. He said the president looked old and thin and drawn. He sat looking straight ahead with his mouth open as if he was taking in things. Everyone was shocked by his appearance. So hypertension kills. So what is the risk of high blood pressure or hypertension? The higher your high blood pressure, the higher the risk of complication. And the most important 
and the most dreaded and the most devastating complication is stroke. And you can actually have two kinds of stroke. You can have a stroke which is caused by uh, the artery rupturing, so it's what we call a hemorrhagic stroke, bleeding inside the brain. Or you can have what we call ischemic stroke, where the artery get choked up, and then there's a lack of blood flow to the uh, brain, you get a stroke as well. So how many strokes are there in this country every year? Guess how many stroke? 9,000 people have stroke every year. And guess how many people have heart attack every year in this country? 12,000 people with, uh, with heart attack. And hypertension is a risk factor for stroke and heart attack. So this is a patient with uh, bleeding. This you can see the blood in the brain. And when you have a bleeding like that in your brain, pretty much you are dead. So 80% of people with such a degree of uh, bleed in the brain are going to die from the hemorrhagic stroke. And this is what happened to our Mrs. Lee Kuan Yew. She has repeated hemorrhagic stroke. The I complication of the heart is actually from hypertension. Can, the uh, hypertension can cause thickening of the heart muscle. So this is a normal, this is a normal thickness of the wall. Now this is a very, very thickened uh, heart muscle. The heart can fail, the heart can develop abnormal heart rhythm, and the arteries can be thickened. And so this is what happened here. When you have a normal artery because of hypertension, you have cholesterol and fat that is deposited inside, that causes your heart attack when the artery is completely choked up. And heart hypertension is one of the two main risk factors for end-stage kidney failure in this country after diabetes. All right, so this is a patient's with end-stage renal failure requiring dialysis, not a very good thing uh, to have. 300 people require are put on dialysis program every year in Singapore. So hypertension can also cause blindness. Not only does hypertension itself uh, cause all the complications, if you have diabetes, if you smoke, you have cholesterol at the same time, or if you're uh, old, the more risk factors you have, the higher your risk of stroke. So when we con control somebody's hypertension, it's not just the blood pressure we're looking at, at it. We're actually looking at the whole person. Because when you manage the lifestyle of a patient well, you treat every single risk factor in this person, from his blood pressure to his sugar to his cholesterol to his body weight and so forth. Because for every decline of one millimeter mercury of your blood pressure, your risk of heart attack reduced by 2 to 3%. Collectively, if you control your blood pressure, your chance of stroke goes down by 40%. Your chance of heart attack goes by, down by 25%. Your chance of heart failure goes down by 50%. So that's how powerful the treatment of hypertension can be in terms of preventing hypertension. So now, how do we treat hypertension? The whole idea of treating hypertension is to prevent complication and of course, to control all the other concurrent risk factors that you have at the same time. And so the first pillar of high blood pressure treatment is your lifestyle. And when we talk about lifestyle, restrict salt, reduce body weight, increase fiber, no smoking, avoid excessive alcohol, exercise regularly, develop relaxation therapy. First pillar of high blood pressure treatment because every, if you are obese, Every one kilogram weight loss results in one to two millimeter fall in the systolic blood pressure. Even if you just reduce weight alone, it actually helps to make the effect of the medicine better, more effective. You don't have to use so many blood pressure medicine to control the blood pressure. Mind you, when you have hypertension and you are on medicine, 70% of you will require two or more blood pressure medicine to control the blood pressure to the desired level, to the normal level. Seldom do you have your blood pressure able to be controlled with just one medicine. But by concurrently managing your body weight and your lifestyle, we can reduce the number of blood pressure medicine that you need to take to control your blood pressure. Okay, because when you reduce your weight, you also control your sugar and your cholesterol. And exercise, of course, has got many, many uh, advantages, but to me, uh, Exercise's biggest advantage is actually to fight depression, fight constipation, and fight insomnia. Okay, so this is the real benefit of uh, hypertension. Besides all the uh, exercise, besides all the other benefits, including lowering your blood pressure. 
So we have a certain diet that we propose, and this is a diet that has been proven in the, some of the clinical studies called the DASH diet. DASH diet advocates that you eat more whole grains, fruits, vegetables, oily fish, and low-fat diary. DASH diet discourages you from taking red meat, unhealthy oil, salt, sugar, full-fat dairy products, and alcohol. But I want to recommend our own Singapore healthy diet, which is recommended by Singapore Heart Foundation, for which I'm also the chairman, is that we recommend half of your portion of uh, food to be fruits and vegetables, a quarter protein, a quarter whole grain. So that is our health plate, a smart eating, heart smart healthy plate. But I want to talk about salt, because salt is actually a very important component to our blood pressure level. There is this thing called salt sensitivity. There are some of us here who are what we term salt sensitive. In people without hypertension, normal individual, 25% of you are going to be salt sensitive. When I say salt sensitive, it means you increase your salt intake, immediately your blood pressure goes up. When you have hypertension, 50% of you are going to be salt sensitizer. And we find that it's actually very common among Asian elderly, people with diabetes, and people who are older. And so how do you know whether you are one of those who are salt sensitive? You take a high sodium content uh, diet, you find that, hey, my blood pressure go up, I start to have swelling in my legs, and also perhaps I have go to the u uh, toilet more often, and I have extreme tears and so forth. So these are all signs of a salt sensitive uh, individual versus people who are not so salt sensitive. So, so we want to encourage people to reduce salt intake. Why, how effective is salt reduction? We need only about 500 milligrams, which is 0.5 gram of sodium a day. Sodium is of course very important. It's good, important for our normal function as far as nerve and so forth. Our normal common salt uh, that we consume has got 40% of sodium inside it and 60% of chloride. Whether it's a sea salt, Himalayan salt, or common table salt, the content is the same. 40% sodium, 60% chloride. And what is the recommendations? WHO recommends you only need one teaspoon of salt a day for your normal well-being, or two grams of sodium a day. But what is Singaporean's average? Nine grams of salt, or 3,600 milligrams of sodium, far higher than the recommended level of 2,000 milligrams of sodium. So how effective is salt reduction? Every one gram reduction reduces heart attack and stroke by 4 and 6% respectively. There was one particular famous study done in China two years ago. They took a village population and gave them the salt, a new salt, which is a low sodium salt, higher in terms of potassium. So they replaced the sodium inside their salt with addition uh, potassium. So they reduce the sodium content by 25%. And when you reduce anything uh, less than 25%, uh, you're not going to tell the difference in terms of the taste. But anytime you reduce it more, you add more potassium beyond 30%, then the person can actually tell uh, that this is salt is quite different. So they just basically replace half of the population with a low sodium salt, with a potassium rich salt, and immediately they reduce stroke and heart attack and death. That's how powerful in the three, four year, year of follow-up study, how powerful a reduction of salt. This is conducted in, the, in China in the northeastern side where high salt content is really part of their staple. So now let's look at Singaporean. Uh, Singaporean, we realize that 75% of your daily salt intake comes from your seasoning, your sauce and so forth. And because Singaporean, one third of Singaporeans eat out more than seven times a week outside, 80% of Singaporeans eat out at hawker center more than one time per week, your choice of food in the hawker center becomes very important as far as your daily salt intake is concerned. Let me tell you that sodium is actually found in every kind of food stuff, whether it's a healthy food where it's somewhat lower. So an apple will have 0.1% of your daily requirement contains about 1.7 milligram of sodium. But if you look at some of this sauce here, particularly a chicken stock, you have 50% of your uh, daily sodium requirement in one single cube. Instant noodle is the best. You re one instant noodle package 
you hit 80% of your sodium intake in a day. So let's look at some of the food that actually have a hidden sodium. So if your thousand islands is actually quite low, but when you look at sweet soya sauce, you're looking at 28% of your, of your sodium intake. But these are the killer. The killer here is your fishball noodle. If you drink the entire soup, you basically exceed the entire day of sodium intake of uh, 2,000 milligram. Now it's 2009. So your laksa and so far. Look at this one. Mi soto and ayam pane basically kills you as far as your sodium content here. Just one single meal without anything else, you already nearly use up your sodium quota for the day. Let's look again. Nasi lemak, uh, mi goreng is the worst. Long tong is just as bad. So mindful of what you consume. So Singapore government or health promotion board has an aspirational goal. We want to reduce your sodium intake by 15% in five years time. And how are we going to ask you to reduce your sodium 15% in five years time? So there's a whole series of education uh, is going to come on. We're going to ask people to eat healthy. Actually, when you eat anything, just don't add salt anymore or add any sodium, uh, any soya sauce because there's already enough sodium in the natural food stuff that you're consuming. Eat plain rice instead of flavored rice. Use some of the spices instead of salt in cooking. Avoid processed, canned and preserved food. We have some of the healthy recipe available in our Singapore Heart Foundation website that you can freely access to learn how to cook a healthy diet and learn how to read the uh, food label as well. So when you read food label, uh, when somebody says salt-free, it means less than 5 milligram of sodium per 100 gram. Not completely zero sodium, you know, but low sodium or sodium-free equivalent. But when you talk about very low sodium, it will be less than 40 milligram. Usually low in salt is less than 120 milligrams. So learn how to read the salt labels in your food uh, products. And so we talk about which salt is better. Don't want to say which salt is better, but this salt actually are no difference. Sea salt, Himalayan salt from a common salt. What you need to look out for will be the low sodium salt, a lot of uh, potassium salt diet. Don't want to tell you which brand and so forth. You can go and look up the supermarket and so forth. Unfortunately, healthy salts are also more expensive than a common salt. So I'm just going to have one slide. This is the second pillars of hypertension treatment medicine. There are six classes of blood pressure medicine. Some medicines are more suitable for certain people. Some are not, uh, some maybe not so. But the question that I've always asked is, which one is the best? My answer is the blood pressure medicine that can control your blood pressure to the desired level without causing any side effect on you at the cost that you can afford is the perfect blood pressure medicine for you. <laughs> Everything else is about the same. The third pillar of high blood pressure, should you have your blood pressure uncontrollable with lifestyle, with multiple medicine, still have high blood pressure level. Now we have a latest treatment. Again, this is what we call a renal denervation. This is a procedure where we put the catheter into your kidney artery and we from inside the kidney artery we burn off these nerves that are actually encircling this kidney artery because we know that the stimulations of these nerves outside the kidney artery actually causes blood pressure to be elevated and so this has now become the third pillars of hypertension should the first two be unsuccessful so what is the goal blood pressure level this is the uh, final uh, uh, Information I want to share with you. Should we treat blood pressure to less than 140-90 or should we treat blood pressure to less than 130-80? What is the goal level? For the Americans, they say all adults must lower the blood pressure to less than 130-80. Singapore is less than 140-90. So we are corroborated by the European. So the European agree that, okay, lower 140-90. But if you are uh, somewhat... Uh, young person and you can afford to lower the blood pressure to less than 130, uh, that will be good. So less than 130, 80 seems to be the ideal blood pressure uh, that we are uh, uh, hearing from the Americans. 
and the European. So now Singapore Heart Foundation, together with Singapore Cardiac Society, so we start and we say recommends less than 130 80 as well, being the new target blood pressure for everybody. So go, so when you take medicine and so forth, your new blood pressure level is 130 80 and below. So conclusion, hypertension, major public health concern. Early diagnosis and intervention is important to prevent complication. And you need a combined approach here, lifestyle and pharmacological therapy to treat your hypertension. With that, thank you very much for your attention. They're going to bring the chairs out. I you'll have to have a seat in a moment. Folks, I know it's a Singaporean audience. When you all groaned when you saw the wonton me and how much <laughs> it occupies in terms of your <clears throat> sodium intake. Was it the wonton me? Was that the one that had the loudest groan? Laksa. Everybody had their own one. That's it. What's going to happen right now is, of course, we've got our Q&A segment that's lined up. I know many of you need a quick washroom break. No problem. Uh, and after this, I'll be doing the lucky draw. We're, we're, we're going to do it differently. It's going to be a bit fun, okay? Uh, and you're going to be able to walk away with vouchers worth up to $200 in total from NTUC. Folks, why don't we pop on stage and have a seat for our Q&A in the meantime? I do want to remind you that we'll also be giving out the uh, bentos. I'm sure it's low sodium bento coming up later on, on the way out. And they'll be handing out from our sponsor, Marigold, milk from HL. So without further ado, we've got a couple of minutes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say about 10 to 12 minutes of Q&A time. So let's get things started nice and quick. I've got microphones that are going around. Where are our folks carrying the microphones for the Q&A? Raise your hand. There's one over there in the black T-shirt and one in the back. Okay, we've got a question from the lady in front in purple or blue. I apologize, I'm colorblind. Raise your hand and we'll bring the microphone to you, okay? Why don't you also tell us if you have a question specific to anybody else? Excuse me. Hi, microphone lady. Okay, one in morning. the front as well. Uh, okay, we'll go one by one. It's on, so we'll go with the purple lady in purple first. Okay. Good morning. Hi. This question is to you, Professor James. I had two episodes of pulmonary embolism in within five years. I've got currently thrombocytosis. I've been diagnosed with Raynaud's syndrome on the left hand. And unfortunately, because of titration of warfarin, I did not titrate well. I'm allergic to aspirin, so the only option was injecting Claxin, but that was not an option for a long period of time. Um, I was looked after by a cardiologist in NUH, but he has gone to private practice, Dr. Edgar O. Oh. So my question is, currently I'm not on any medication for any of the symptoms. Oh. Um, I'm looked after by Dr. Winnie, hematologist, oncologist, and I've got follow-ups uh, for digestive issues because I'm allergic to many foods and medications. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to know your advice on what should I do for my condition? Is there any option for treatments? Ma'am, thank you very much for sharing your personal experience. I know it's a complicated issue and it's hard to diagnose yeah. with just a, uh, an elaboration like yeah, that. But just, Professor just Yip, needs to know his what would your general advice be in terms yes. of directions that could be open? Uh, n number one, disclaimers. Uh, uh, this is not my patient. Uh, I'm not addressing her medical conditions. Mm. Uh, I, I'm just going to address in, in total about some of the things like uh, pulmonary embolism. Uh, yes, so, so this is a condition that... Uh, uh, I mentioned earlier, clots in the lung, usually from the legs. Uh, and, and, and this is just to answer in general, uh, not specific to you, ma'am, because I, I think I, I should not address your medical condition in, in public. Uh, so so okay, these you can accost him later outside. <laughs> but you that. can accost me in the corridor later. Yes. So, so in, in general, uh, you know, uh, when you go for long trips, bus coaches, flights, uh, if you have chance for a pit stop, please get up and move around a little bit because pulmonary embolism is one of those conditions that 
uh, can affect people and usually cause sudden death you know, immediately after a trip. Uh, so that's not a nice thing. So uh, if you're on a plane, on a coach, if you have time to walk around, please move around a bit. If you've had previous pulmonary embolism, then all the more so. Some, some people wear stockings. Uh, some, most of these patients don't need lifelong blood thinners unless you have it repeatedly. So there are other blood thinners other than warfarin uh, that we do give. Sometimes injectables as well that they can have. And in fact, if you're off these drugs and your hematologist says you can be off these drugs, sometimes we do tell them uh, to, to give you a prophylactic dose before you go for one of these long trips. So it's not take forever, but take for a while. Uh, like I said, pulmonary hypertension uh, doesn't affect uh, all these patients. Maybe only 5 to 7% of them will have a persistently raised pulmonary pressures due to remodeling of your heart artery, uh, of your lung arteries after getting pulmonary embolism. It is one of those triggers. Uh, so, I, I mean, those are the general advice for people uh, when you want to go for their long trips, move around, walk around, don't sit in your seat the whole day watching TV, movies on the flight, but move around a bit because you, you do need to uh, maintain that circulation. Ma'am, it does sound like you have very specific, I mean, concerns as well. So I would advise you, like, let's have, come have a chat later on as well if you we want with our doctors. But I do want to open it up to the rest of the floor for more questions as well. Ma'am in the front, hi, who's your question for? I actually have three chronic disease, asthma, iron deficiency, and bipolar disorder, as well as high hypothesium. Okay, I know the shortness of breath can from asthma and bipolar. Dizziness can from bipolar and iron deficiency. How to differentiate them from my disease and the heart problem? Okay, another one is sal salmon very high in potassium. Any alternative fish I can eat for my heart? Anti inflammation food you show all high in potassium. Mm. What's the alternative? My bipolar medicine causes me to put on weight. How? <laughs> <laughs> I born with one kidney. So, how to tell my hypertension is from my family or from the chronic disease, chronic kidney disease, as secondary hypertension? Thank you, ma'am, for preparing those questions. Let's open it up. To the, there's a couple of things to unpack there, uh, but, but we'll try and give some of the important advice. Professor Tan? Oh, she's offering her mic as well. Thank you. <laughs> so obviously, you have many uh, what we call comorbidities here. I think the best here a way is to address your symptoms is to have a conversation with your doctor to see what's exactly going on here. Uh, specifically to a hypothesium problem, uh, if you have normal kidney function, hypothesium has actually has got no clinical significance, in my opinion. So it's only a problem if you have a kidney failure that we need to worry about it. In terms of your uh, uh, medications and so forth, whether they interact and so forth, like I say, this is a, it's a very personal thing. So I, I will encourage you to just speak with your own doctor. Yeah. In terms of the dizziness that she was talking about, I mean, I could apply that question to a lot of people. One of the symptoms we were talking about with um, the first discussion was how to differentiate some of these symptoms from what could be a heart issue versus something else. Is there anything to indicate or give us in some direction? So, so dizziness itself is actually a very non-specific symptom. Uh, so it could very well be related to the heart. I sit down too long, stand up, I can get dizzy. Correct. Correct. So that's postural. So that's just one of the causes where you can actually have a, a postural hypotension, what we call it, where you have a drop in blood pressure when you get up from a sitting to a standing position that occurs in Everybody actually, especially yeah. the elderly and so forth, or diabetic and so forth. So, dizziness itself by, by itself tells you nothing. It doesn't tell you what is the cause, whether it's heart or lung, just, just not even resting well. Yeah. Uh, having a poor night's sleep can make you uh, dizzy, or, or taking a long, long journey in a car can get you dizzy, and so forth. So, again, so this is something that we really want to, to drill down uh, the cause, you need a, a full examination. But suffice to say, if your dizziness or your symptoms occurs as a result of some kind of exertion, mm. so if you do a physical walk and you feel every time you do that you, you pass out, or you actually have dizziness that results in true fainting spell, you just collapse completely, those are very ominous uh, symptoms of dizziness to me. Mm. Exertional related, accompanied uh, uh, by a total loss of consciousness and so forth. So these are things that uh, will raise my level of uh, suspicion uh, as to something else more serious is happening. Ma'am, thank you very much. Talk later. Uh, I just want to say some of my guests have said they feel dizzy after a tough interview with me. I'm sorry about that. Uh, gentleman in the back, 
I see you there. Go ahead with the microphone. Oh, lady. Okay, my question is, does Takashi uh, Shibo be uh, more prone to... Does what? Sorry, I, I beg your pardon. Can you say that again? Takashibo. When a person is diagnosed with Takashibo, will this person be more prone to heart failure? And if this person also has pre-hypertension, taking a curry late at night, is it bad for the heart? <laughs> I, love, I love the Singaporean questions because we always include food, fish, curry, it's all coming in. Dr. Sim. So I think I'll take this yeah. question. Um, so for Takashibo, yes, it, it actually... Uh, patient can present with heart failure symptoms um, because the heart is weak, unable to pump blood to the, the body and um, they can also have congestion of the lung, so water retention. So these are all the signs of heart failure that you can get from Takasubo. Um, some of the patients actually, um, the heart function actually can recover completely. But in the short term, actually the risk of death, as I pointed out just now, was around 5%. So we do need to keep a close eye if you have uh, been diagnosed with Takasubo. Um, in terms of the curry uh, <laughs> late at night, I think... Uh, I think in general <laughs> it's not a good idea whether or not you have takutsubo, right? Um, maybe, uh, I, I'm not sh uh, if, if it's a, a balanced diet, then it's okay. Not like every night you're eating curry. I think that would increase your risk of getting uh, reflux disease, I think. That's true. <laughs> There are other diseases as well. Folks, um, I know we're supposed to end at 12 o'clock sharp, but we started a little bit later. Are you okay if I take a few more questions and we end at about 12.05? Is that okay with everybody? I just want to make sure we have time for everybody's questions, okay? So we've got about seven minutes more of questions. In the back, we've got one there. Hi, go ahead. Hello, Dr. Sim Wan. I saw your video with uh, Nimbi. With oh, I'm uh, so sorry, my dear. I can't hear you that clearly. Can we... Um, Either increase the volume or you talk louder. Hello, Dr. Sim Hui Wen. I saw your video with uh, Li Bi Wa. So what fish do you recommend? And Dr. Tan, your talk is very cheap uh, and I enjoy it very much because it expanded my awareness and broadened my horizons. So uh, I see that you're in pretty good shape for someone your age. Yeah, I just found out your age. So uh, I just want to ask, uh, what do you eat and what you stay away from? and your exercise regime. What exercise you do, how many times a week, the <laughs> intensity, and how long each session. Thank you. I love it. I love it. Oh, so, uh, so, actually, I didn't hear the you? first yes, one. Correct. I couldn't make out the first one. I'm so sorry. Yeah, I saw Dr. Sim's uh, video with Dan Bi uh, the MP. Now no longer MP. La. So Are I want you? to ask, what fish do you recommend? Oh. <laughs> Go watch the video. <laughs> No, I, mean, I didn't recommend that. Yeah, so uh, I, think, I think in the hawker centre, I think there are not many fishes that you can choose from. I think it's like either batang or grouper or something. But in general... CNA uh, has I a great documentary on all that white <laughs> fish and how it's yeah. actually not very healthy. <laughs> Go watch the CNA documentary because all fish farmed in a... Anyway, anyway. I think uh, more importantly, it's not like the type of the fish, but uh, don't take the fried one. And like the soup, like Prof Tan said, don't drink all the soup because it's really high in sodium and MSG. Um, in terms of the uh, exercise, uh, <laughs> I'm not that old actually, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm not 40 yet. <laughs> so, uh, but I have She's two the kids. youngest person on this <laughs> stage, probably, okay? <laughs> but I have two young kids, so uh, how do I maintain like, a healthy like, lifestyle? And so it's through exercising. So myself, I actually do exercise like four times a week. Even if my kids are actually like quite young, so I, difficult for me to find time, but if you make it your priority, then you make it happen. So I actually wake up 6 a.m. to exercise four times a week. So that's how I maintain Four hours. times a week? <laughs> yes, four times a week. <laughs> Professor Tan, how many hours per week? Uh, probably for twi I've interviewed this man for over 10 years. Right. He's looked the same okay. for over 10 years. So I think healthy minutes? lifestyle is the key to longevity. I mean, there's no question about it. And uh, exercise must feature uh, very strongly. So I exercise every other day, uh, four to five times a week. So I alternate between cardio and uh, um, anaerobic exercise, resistant weight training. So, uh, so adopt whatever exercise regimen that you're most comfortable with and what you enjoy most. So if you don't like running, you don't have to run. But if you enjoy dancing, you enjoy swimming, by all means, because these are all various forms of exercise as well. Four more minutes. I'll take a couple more questions as well. Uh, I, I would like to inject. Yeah. I would like to be a speaker for those who want to sleep more. Because uh, for the first time, you know, the American Heart Association now includes sleep as a method for cardiovascular risk uh, uh, protection. 
you have to sleep more than seven hours in a day to make a difference. And I think all the devices, all the Netflix, all these things are, are causing Singaporeans to sleep less and less. So if you can't exercise, at least get your beauty sleep of seven hours or more. Too much sleep can be bad though as well, do you think? I mean, nine, nine hours, no good, uh, right? Only if you're overweight and you have sleep apnea. That's so true. so I, I think that weight bit, uh, I, I think... Uh, the other problem, uh, we're, we're going to be able to beat diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol in the next 30 years. The biggest problem that we have is a Singaporean problem, obesity. Yeah. So we're going to have more heart attacks uh, in the next 30 years, uh, you know, 400% increase by 2050. And it is going to be all driven by obesity. So weight is the other thing we really need to watch out for. Ma'am in the second row here, hi. Hi, this question is for Dr. Vitelli. So my brother dissected uh, in January uh, and he had a bypass surgery, right? Uh, open heart surgery, so he was... Uh, sorry, can you hold it a bit closer? Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. So he was amputated and he was in the hospital for one month, so he was in a coma, but he didn't make it. So for us siblings, right, uh, I mean he's in his early 20s, so do you recommend screening for us and how often should it be done? Thank you. Your loss. Thank you so much for sharing. Dr. Vitali Familio? Yeah. Hello. Uh, yeah. First of all, sorry for your loss. And uh, I understand you're also young and looks like your brother probably was young as well. So once you have uh, these aortic conditions arise in a young age, uh, it, it's a very good idea to go for uh, checking the screening so the, and the family screening, especially the siblings. So it's very important, yeah. You should go for it, yeah. Dr. Vital, if you mentioned that there is aortic screening. Who should go for some of these aortic screenings? So the, there are a few teams involved. So the, we, we, with the teams of imaging, so when we do scans and checking the size of the arteries, mm -hmm. with the genetic clinic, uh, uh, which is um, uh, where checking do you have any wrong genes to have aortic condition, which is good for uh, and recommended for younger patients. Yeah, so and we have uh, just normal aortic clinic where you can come and you can do some simple tests. What if after this 200 people go and sign up and want to do it? I mean, does everybody need to think about doing it? Uh, yeah, we need a bit of time, but we can be able to process. One more thing to add to the list, everybody. Okay, uh, where's the next mic standing there? Yes, hi, ma'am over there. I'm going to take, after this, one more question. Uh, good, good morning. Mine is a very simple question. Yeah. If we have a BP that is pretty normal, 128, 60, uh, 85, sort of, but the heart rate, the, the pulse rate on the, on the machine is something like 45, is that something to be concerned? Regularly? Regularly. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. So your baseline heart rate is a reflection of your fitness level. So if you are someone who is, uh, exercises regularly, you find that your heart rate is slower than a normal person. Normal heart rate varies between 60 to 90 bits per minute. If your heart rate is slow but you're completely well, no symptoms whatsoever of dizziness or fainting and so forth, and that you're able to perform usual activity, exercise and so forth, then leave it alone. But the moment you have symptoms of giddiness and is easy, easily out of breath and so forth, then perhaps you want to seek a consult. But other than that, uh, for a young person like yourself, just leave alone. <laughs> We're all young at heart. I'm going to take the last question, but before I do, just a quick mention, as you're driving out later, Dr. Sim's interview on Health Matters will be repeated on CNA 938. And it's a whole hour, so you can listen to that as well, where we discuss women's heart health. So after the 2 p.m. news, at about 2.10 p.m., it'll start off. Okay, well, there's another interview before. 2.15 p.m. will be her interview that starts off. You can listen to our discussion that we had this past week. It's airing again on CNA 938. I've said the wrong time. 3.15 p.m. Sorry, sorry. So you can have your bento. Then when you drive off, 3.15 p.m., tune in CNA 938. Last question. We've got it over here. Hi, uh, uh, what's happening? It's you. Oh, the microphone you need, I see. Good morning, uh, my name is Rebecca. I just Hi, want Rebecca. to know for a person close to 60 years old, have a very good health record, except a high cholesterol of like two, six, total cholesterol 276 with a low 
LDL is a 185. So is uh, taking medication is a mandatory requirement or just merely improve the frequency of exercise and change drastic change in the food intake? Doctors, medication or exercise first? In Can case. I? Can we get the stats? What, what was the number again? LDL is how much? Uh, LDL 185. 185. Yes. And your HDL? Um, 75. Okay. So I have a whole group of uh, women uh, like yourself who seems to have uh, elevated cholesterol level, both for the good cholesterol, which is HDL, and the LDL cholesterol, mm. which is the bad mm. cholesterol. Is it usually one or the other? Uh, sometimes you can have both happening in the sense. That's why I say there's a group of uh, women of, uh, uh, of uh, age and so forth that may have such a finding. Uh, oftentimes, I can tell you that after I've worked out everything and so forth, they're completely well. So, so one of the ways to actually tell me whether you need to take cholesterol medicine or not is to, of course, go through your history first. Do you have a family history? Do you have any other concomitant risk factors like hypertension, smoking, diabetes? If everything else is normal, one of the things that I always do is do what we call an X-ray of your heart artery, called a CT angiogram or uh, CT calcium, and see whether the calcium is high or low. And I can tell you that people like yourself is going to have a CT calcium of zero, no blockage whatsoever, in which case then just leave alone. You don't even have to take medicine for it. Thank Check you in much. with your doctor, see if you've done those tests. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your questions. A round of applause for our doctors, please. Doctors, please have a seat in the front seat. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of fun right now before uh, I send everybody on their way. And I know they'll be listening to Dr. Sim's interview at 3.15 p.m. on CNA 93. Um, right? Ken? Hey, would you all be interested, uh, just after today's one, would you all be interested in a series on like, how to control hypertension? Like, I think that would be interesting. Professor Tan, we thought, I think it would be interesting. Everybody needs to know more about hypertension and how to control it and reduce it and manage it as well. So, so listen out for that. I think I'll do that on, high, on, high, on health matters very soon. Uh, July, July, no, August, August. I'll do it in August. Thai International Day, how about that? Folks, I've got up to $200, well, in total, $200 worth of vouchers to give away from NTUC. And thanks to the good people here at NUHCS. We're going to have fun, okay? Here's what we're going to do. We're keeping everybody's name into a spin the wheel. And what we're going to do is we're going to spin the wheel. And here's what will happen. No, no, it's not as easy as the win. Your name come out, you win. No. We're going to have a bit of fun. I'm going to ask the five people whose names come out to join me on stage. <laughs> You're not going to... I'm not going to make you dance or sing. Don't worry. It's not Singapore Idol. But on stage, we're going to do, um, there's going to be a, re a reveal of which voucher that you've won. Five letters will appear on screen. N-U-H-C-S. The five people, this is not the, the, the Channel 8 show. I just want each of you all to stand in front of the letter that you like. And then we will unveil which voucher you've got based on the letter you're standing in front of. Shall we play? Yeah. Let's do it! Okay, let's spin the wheel. Okay, wait, 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 wait. One quick agreement, huh? This, for all lucky draws I've done for the last 16 years, I do the same thing. If your name is called but you're not here, spin again. Fair? Okay, done. Let's go. Spin the wheel. Fingers crossed. We're adding some excitement to our lives. Is that good for our heart health? First one, Lim Beng Chong. Lim Beng Chong, are you here? Come on down. Join me on stage. While Mr. Lim is making his way down, let's spin it again and get our second name. See, more fun at it, right? It's like, draw your name, not fun. Come, Mr. Lim. Join me on stage a bit. And your friend, Liu Miao Kun. Liu Miao Kun, are you here? Liu Miao Kun going once. Oh, you're here, sir. Alamak, I'm making you climb on stage. Sorry, lah. But for the game, he will do it. <laughs> Alright, you hang out here with me first. We spin up for Cheryl Tan. Cheryl Tan, come on stage. Hi, Cheryl, are you here? Cheryl in the back as well. I'm making poor Cheryl walk all the way to the front. Was this game a good idea? 
A little bit of exercise, no problem. Huh, Cheryl? We've got an usher that will help you. Come. Can I hear? Is it better here? Can you all hear me louder here? Yeah. Who's next? And Esteresh Kumar! Esteresh Kumar! Are you here? Hello, sir. Have I got five? One, two, three, four. Last one. Fingers crossed. And then we all cheer them and see what prizes they win. Okay? And we've got Wendy Cha. Hi, Wendy. Hey. Oh, she comes to all the health forums. I've seen her at so many health forums for years and years and years. Good to see you. Michelle is lovely. Thank you for asking. She's on my competitor station. We don't talk about that. <laughs> Hi, okay. N U H C S. Pick a letter. See which one you want to stand in front of. You chose an S already. Yeah. Okay, S. Can. Oh, you chose C. Can do. Suresh is going for N. I love it. First of all, aren't they good sports? Can you give them a round of applause? Seriously. Shall we do the Channel 8 thing? No, no, no. Yeah. Okay, on the count of three, we will unveil. In total, it adds up to $200 NTUC vouchers, and it'll be split into denominations. Let's see, let's see who gets what. Fingers crossed. On the count of three, let's unveil it. In one, two, three. Yay! That's how much you've got! <laughs> Some more happy than others. <laughs> Thank you so much. We'll get your vouchers to you right now in just a moment as we invite Professor Yip back on stage to present you your vouchers. Professor Yip, join me over here. Why don't you? We've got our five lucky winners and we, you know the voucher or not? Okay, we go from the, from, for N, $50, Mr. Suresh, congratulations! Our $30 voucher, so thank you very much. Our $60 voucher, big winner. <laughs> our $20 voucher winner. And our $40 voucher winner. Hey, can we have a little group shot with our winners and Professor Yip? With our winners. Before you go, two reminders. Bento, don't forget. HL Milk, don't forget. They pack into cooler bags for you guys already. And one more thing. Ah. What do you think, Photo? Don't forget, Health Matters, every day, 4 p.m. on CNA 938. We talk to doctors every day. Okay, so tune in and catch the interviews then and call in your questions. Thank you to our winners. Congratulations. To all of you, have a safe day. Thank you to NUHCS for this wonderful event. Take care, everybody. Bye.